Hi, LinkedIn friends. I am so happy to be here today with you and also with my good friend, Martin Lindstrom. Uh, Martin is an amazing thinker. He is, uh, a, a, in addition to being a friend, uh, we are part of uh, Marshall Goldsmith's 100 Coaches community together. We are both members of the uh, Thinkers 50 list. And Martin, in 2008, created what is now a seminal book uh, called Biology, B-U-Y-ology, uh, where he talked about the, the future of business, the future of retail, and how and why we buy. And so Martin, actually, during the midst of the coronavirus, ev everybody else was uh, eating bonbons and, and learning the ukulele, and Martin wrote a new book. He wrote an ebook called Biology for a Coronavirus World. So we're so happy to have you here. I would actually love to see who is on uh, the live stream with us. And so uh, if uh, if you guys can, you know, say hi, chime in, uh, let us know where you're where you're in from, that would be uh, that would be amazing. Uh, and so we can just see who's here. And we also, of course, want to make sure that we are taking your uh, questions as well. But Martin, I wanted to start out uh, by asking you uh, a first question. I started reading your book. And the first thing that really struck me uh, was you mentioned that one of the 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 crazy things, one of one of the sort of biggest and most noticeable elements of uh, business in the in the coronavirus world is that for some strange reason, I am not sure why there might be that reason that we may end up with a lack of empathy moving forward. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can. Well, first of all, Dory, fantastic to be on, on your show. I mean, you and I have known each other for, I don't know, a long time, it feels like, right? And and I think one of the reasons why you connect with, with people so well is because of empathy. And that's what you're learning to uh, using the mask. I'll tell you an interesting story. I actually went to Hong Kong in the end of January this year, and um, it was kind of a surreal experience. I went on the plane as everyone was disembarking from that plane going to Hong Kong. And I went through the streets in Hong Kong, and there was just in, in the break between all these demonstrations that they had. And everyone was wearing masks. And it was the first time I was bumped into a reality where everyone was wearing masks. Remember, the rest of the world had not really realized COVID-19 by then. And I went to some of my favorite restaurants. And uh, I, I knew the waiters. I've known the waiters for 20 or 30 years, literally. And uh, I was like I was disconnected with them. I could not communicate the same way. It was like there was a glass window between them and me. And I realized that all the facial expressions literally were gone. And it was very scary because what I've learned over the years is that when we connect with other people, we have to do it through empathy, the ability to put yourself in another person's shoe and li literally see the world from that person's point of view. And I, I know that when I talk about empathy, it sounds like a, a small, sweet you know, cookies and stuff like that. That's not what I'm thinking about here. I'm thinking about empathy in the ability to really understand another person. And what we have learned, and this sounds crazy, but we've learned over the years that empathy is actually read through the subtle, small micro changes you do in your face. Um, there's an experiment done with a young lady uh, and her baby. Uh, I think it was only a sort of a, a one year old kid. And, and uh, she literally was asked not to move her face at all as she talked to the baby and really not do any facial expressions. And within two minutes, this baby just threw a tantrum and went on the floor and screamed. And the micro movements which were lacking really was disconnecting her between her and, and her babies. And that's exactly what I was lacking uh, in Hong Kong. And what I've since seen across the world as I've been traveling, despite all this stuff, to understand uh, empathy and how it's disappearing. So my conclusion is two things. One is because of COVID-19, um, the concept of empathy is fading down. But even worse, as the world is opening up now again and people can get back to a normal life and thank God for that, there's another level of empathy disappearing, and that is us, you and I now sitting behind our screens. Uh, you and I normally would have been uh, next to each other, right? In fact, one of our clients, a pharma client, said to me the other day that, listen, we have cut our cost in half. 
literally because of this. I don't see a reason why we need to put people back on the road anymore, the reps back on the road or whatever, um, because they do the job just as well out there. Well, think about this for a second. Think about the fact that suddenly I'm not going to meet people anymore. I'm not going to go into an office anymore. I'm not going to meet the doctors, professors, whatever it is. You're basically seeing the world through a, a, a two-way mirror. So the long story short here is we are increasingly going to see the world through a two-way mirror. And I tend to say after nine hours of conference call, I feel I've been observing the world but never really participating in it because empathy is slowly dying. It's a it's a very, very disruptive thinking right now, and it's very scary if we lose it because then we, we basically lose our human connection with each other, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really that's really powerful and disturbing, Martin. And I just want to greet some of the wonderful people that are joining us. We have a, an amazingly international crowd. We have, uh, of course, our, our, our faithful friend Carlos from Colombia. We have Pankaj in India. We have Anna from uh, from Cary, North Carolina. Gretel from Spain. Uh, Ina from Toronto. Uh, we've got uh, we've got Celia from Brooklyn and Philip from New Haven. We've got uh, Miranda from Rochester and Riza from from Turkey and Joanna from Amsterdam. Uh, this is this is fantastic. Thank you guys. We have Win Min from uh, from Singapore. We're so happy to have all of you guys here. So uh, we want to make sure we're taking your questions shortly. But I first wanted to ask you uh, another one, Martin, that occurred to me as I was reading your book. And actually, just as a quick technical question, someone says, "How can we get this amazing new ebook of Martin's?" Martin, what is uh, what is the the link? What is the uh, the best way for people to obtain uh, biology for a corona? Coronavirus world. If someone well, is, well, it's, it's super simple. You can go into my web address, which is martinlindstrom.com. So that's my name you have down there. dot com, or I'm sure they could go into your 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 social media channels and see it there right now. And it's free of charge, really. So you just download it, send it on to whoever you will. Uh, really, the reason why I wrote it is because I I had time to reflect on the world, and I thought, why not share those thoughts with everyone in the world? And I think as a consequence of that. We've had nearly a million people downloading the book, book right now, um, and it's just been fascinating to um, to see um, how people are taking this crazy thinking I have on board and used it for themselves to get through this crisis and prepare for a new world coming out on the other side, right? Yeah, that's that's amazing. So on the question, Martin, of how to get through to the other side, one of the things that you mentioned in the book is that even when things uh, you know, come back, so to speak, even even when people are uh, going to be reconvening and are allowed to reconvene, that actually you think there's going to be a kind of hangover from this experience uh, that it's, uh, I believe you call it a negative somatic event. Is that the right yeah. term? What do yeah. you mean by that? And how does that play out? Well, I think the the reality now is that we have and we continue to be part of an incredible fear-driven society. Uh, Dory, you are sadly experiencing that right now in your country uh, with the Black Lives Matter. And fear uh, is so prominent because it is addictive. And let me just pause here for a second and put you into a context. There is, there is a, a part in our brain called the amygdala, which is also called the fear spot. And the amygdala is, from our studies, has shown to be a, a spot not only where fear is recorded, but it's also accumulated. And we actually have learned today through our studies that it's accumulated across multiple tracks, even though the fear event has nothing to do with each other. So let me give you an example. For example, if you have someone breaking into your house or your apartment and stealing stuff, uh, I'm sure most of you guys would have tried it. Uh, will agree with me that that's a very uncomfortable feeling. You're sleeping in that bed, perhaps he has or he has been in that bed. But here's the reality that when you now walk on the street the next time, you actually are more fearful as well. Uh, so fear is accumulating through channels. And if I go back in history, you will actually notice that that fear accumulation has has really grown a lot through society or the the last many years. It actually began perhaps already back in 1964 when the Democrats were broadcasting a, a, a commercial which is called the Daisy TV commercial and really threatened voters with the nuclear extinction if the Republican candidate, I think he was Barry Goldwater, was elected back then. And guess what? The Democrat actually won. Now, that whole story was repeated in 2004 where George W. Bush rolled out another fear back 
Great Place TV ad, and that was some wolf crossing the borders, and it was really an indirect metaphor for these secret terrorist attacking. Now, what was interesting about those two commercials were that people absolutely, in all research studies, hated those commercials, but in both cases, the candidates won. And fear has since then accumulated. Just look at the domestic violence, which has gone up 30% in California. Uh, you will see we have sexual harassment, we have continuation, we have crime, we have personal identity theft, all that stuff, and now Black Lives Matter is on top of it means that we are on the hard no hardcore drive, overdrive of the amygdala at the moment. And so if you have that in mind, what has happened in our society is two things. One is that when uh, the COVID-19 happened, we actually had watched multiple trailers around this topic way before it actually happened. Now, you think I'm crazy, but think about it. Think about Contagion, a major blockbuster a Hollywood movie. You had outbreaks. You had Black Mirror, the British TV series. You had The Rain, the Danish series. You had the James Bond movies with Moonraker and all the stuff. All those movies were really all about a virus breaking out. And what was really ironic was that we kind of been primed on top of all this stuff. And then what happened was that, well, what happened was what happened in 2009. Because in 2009, you had the H1N1 virus breaking out and also called the swine flu virus. And back then, 2 billion people were infected by it. 2 billion, that's with a B, not a, a, an M here. 2 billion people were affected by it and 203,000 people died at least. And I don't recall a frenzy like the one we're talking about right now. Now that was four years after Facebook was invented. So social media was really not on hype. Now today, social media is on its overdrive and we know that what's spreading the most is fear and all the algorithms are more or less aligned around that hypothesis. So what I'm saying to you right now is that fear has really increased in our society to an extreme degree that that probably will continue as a rolling effect. So we will be much more on alert, much more fearful. And because of that, we retract back to our tribes and try to feel safe in our little cocoons because we don't know what's coming next. And that's the worst thing that's going to happen because then we're destroying empathy, as we talked about before, but we're also destroying sense of belonging and all those aspects. And the output of that is even worse because then we'll have depression and depression is going through the roof right now. We will see that people will not dare to go to the hospitals anymore. We will see that people uh, will be much more aggressive because they've been isolated. And that whole aspect will mean that I would claim that the number of people sadly dying from uh, the COVID-19 will be much lower than the number of people dying from depression later on. So that is the sad output of all this. And I feel like I'm so depressing to listen to right now. This is not even funny, but that's, back to your question, that's probably what's going to happen now. Yeah, that is that is alarming. And so the last question that I have for you before we move to the questions from the audience, so please go ahead, guys, and start typing them in. I can see some of you have, and my trusty assistant, John, is sending me texts uh, so, I can, uh, so I can grab your best questions. Uh, so please go ahead and put them into the chat box questions for, uh, for Martin. Um, but uh, and I'll also mention to you guys, if you are interested in learning more about any of this, if you want to follow Martin, uh, please, uh, please go ahead and open up a new window in LinkedIn and you can follow Martin Lindstrom. If you are not, if you are finding this uh, stream and you are not already following me, please do so. You can open up a new window, go to doryclark.com. Uh, or I believe you can actually scroll uh, on the top of this post. If you if you hover over uh, our names, you can uh, you can click to follow. Uh, so we'd love to uh, to have you uh, find out more stuff so that we can keep sharing these conversations. But the last question that I have for you, Martin, is given all of this, given the backdrop, given the fear, given the uh, decrease uh, in empathy that it sounds like is coming our way moving forward, how can someone who is in business deal with this? I mean, obviously, as your book points out, great for gun sales, great for toilet paper sales. And, you know, as you mentioned, these are all things related to the lower end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs about personal security and health and things like that. But for people who are not toilet paper manufacturers, what do we do with this? How do we move forward and ensure that our businesses are successful? Well, listen, I, uh, it's a really good question. And I think one thing I learned from one of our clients, which is Lowe's, it's a super martin in your country. Um, 
And Lowe's actually the the uh, the president of Lowe's, Tim Lowe. He said to me the other day, um, they just went through an innovation process with us for six years, where we literally turned them around to become the most innovation supermarket chain in the United States. I, I remember. And I actually think I connected did. you with Lowe's. You did, yeah. That's yes. true. Back through ago, my friend right? Matt. Yeah, back in North Carolina, right? Yeah. Um, and 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 what was fascinating was that that innovation process of six uh, years. Tim said to me that what we've gone through now the six last six weeks has been the same. So we basically have changed as much in six weeks as we did in six years. And as I tend to say that if you go through a storm, if you haven't changed as a result of the storm, you didn't get the message. And this is my overall message to you. You fundamentally have to change because of COVID-19. And I'll explain why. And sorry, Dory, it's going to be a long-winded answer. I'll see if we can do it very we quickly. Love it. Yeah. Love it, but, but so, so here's the case. Uh, Antonio Damascos uh, was his professor out of Portugal. He later on moved to the U.S. He, um, in fact, uh, developed a term called a somatic market. That's what you began the show with. It's O-M-A-T-I-C, somatic market. Somatic market is something so dramatic you'll never forget it. And I'm sure a lot of you guys watching will never forget where you were uh, who you were talking with, even who you called uh, when you heard about 9-11. Uh, it's such a profound, dramatic event that... Um, um, Dory, where were you doing 9-11? Uh, I I remember I had just I had just been laid off the day before, so I uh, I was I was watching watching TV in the morning because I didn't have a job to go to, and I'm like, mm, what am I gonna do today? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so you remember who, where you were, who you called, and how you felt, right? I, like, I do perfectly. It's like it froze the whole world, right? And so a somatic mark is something so dramatic you'll never forget it. I call it an emotional bookmark. Now, you can have negative somatic markers and positive somatic markers. Now, here's what's interesting. Hold that thought for a second. And I want to take you into the world of marketing speak for a second. And um, in marketing speak, a lot of people are talking about entry points. An entry point is where you enter to a new phase of lifestyle. And we actually have seven entry points in our lives. Um, we have an entry point when the first day in school or we have the first time we get married or the first job we get or when you know, we move from home or when we are retiring or whatever it is, seven entry points. And I'm sure a lot of you guys watching right now have tried, if you have a newborn baby at home, that for some reason suddenly there was baby strollers all over the place, right? Uh, because now you expected them and you didn't see it the day before, but it happened in one day. That is where you open your, your eyes to a whole new world. You're entering from one market to another. That's what IKEA has been so good at. They're putting you into this maze and you can't get out of it and it just takes you through all the life stages and then guess what you're repeating it with your son or your daughter 20 years later that's, that's entry points now here's what's fascinating we are now probably for the first time in recent memory entering an eighth entry point and the eighth entry point is really a global synchronized behavioral change we're seeing because we all more or less has been through the same at exactly the same time and that will have a profound impact in how we change. And in one of my books, the small data book, I'm writing about uh, how you actually can identify new needs. In small data, I talk about, I define small data as seemingly insignificant observations you make in people's lives. But really what I'm talking about is we're all out of balance. It may be I feel overweight, so there's a weight loss product for that. It may be I feel insecure. Well, guess what? Tony Robbins is there to help you. Or it may be I feel that um, I don't have any self-esteem, so maybe I go to match.com. But the reality here is that we're all out of balances. And because of this eighth interpont, we'll all be out of balances. And one of the things which is really fascinating is one of the out of balances is the lack of touch. Uh, we haven't touched anyone. We haven't hugged anyone. Dory, I haven't hugged you since we saw each other in San Diego, I think. In January. Time. In That's January, right. right? Yeah. So we haven't hugged each other. We haven't touched people. And we know today there's a direct correlation between the lack of touch and depression. Okay, direct correlation. All sorts of experiments are showing that. So what does it mean? Well, the other day I was walking on the street in Sydney in Australia, and I noticed this old lady. She walked on the street, and out of the blue, she went straight down to a dog from another strange person's dog and started to pet it. I've never seen this before. And the dog, like in the bad movie, was biting back, and it was like, like what's going on here? And what was really amazing the dog was, was she had COVID. <laughs> Get away. Get away. It was a COVID dog, right? And, but what was really interesting was 
I saw this not just once, but five times in one week. I've never seen it before. And I thought, my God, that's a piece of small data. So I went back to the statistics. Get what? Pet sales has gone up 400% over the last month. We are suppressing yourself for the sense of touch. Why do I tell you all this stuff? Because we are out of balances now. And it's the gap between being in balance and out of balance which creates the opportunity for a new product, a new need, or a new service, a new brand perhaps even. So what you guys have to do, you guys out there listening and watching, you have to figure out, you have to look for the small data and turn that around to an opportunity and fulfill that gap with these new opportunities, product, service, needs, brand, whatever it may be. And that's my answer. And basically, you can give me any example for any industry right now, and I'll give you an example about how you can do it because everyone can do it. So that's my challenge to you guys. Find the gap between being in balance and out of balance as a consequence of COVID-19 and turn that into your opportunity. That's amazing. Well, okay, if 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 you you've 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 thrown down the gauntlet, Martin, can you give us just one example from one industry? Like how would you how would you think about it? I mean, feel free to grab uh, to grab whatever comes to mind, but uh, just so we can conceptualize it. I, I cannot give you two examples, that's okay? Yes, absolutely. So I'll take I'll take two industries which have been very severely hit by this. One is the restaurant industry and one is the travel agents, right? So the restaurant industry, as you know, has basically gone down to almost zero. And a lot of them created uh, takeaway food. <laughs> and I was sitting with my favorite local restaurant, uh, the owner, the other day. And he's, he was not crying, but he was certainly severely hit by all this stuff. And it's a luxury restaurant, really high quality dining, Italian restaurant. And as we were discussing, I said to him, so what are you going to do when you're allowed to open for all your guests in a week from now on? And he said, well, we're going to do business as usual. I said to him, you haven't received the message yet. Because the fact is that you can only have 10 tables, not 30 tables as you had. The fact is that there has to be more distance. How are you going to handle it? He said, well, we're just trying to go around it. I said, no, what is your advantage? And this is what's interesting. In the movie, um, uh, State of the Enemy, with Will Smith and, and Gene Hackman. Uh, mm. in, that, in that movie, uh, I think Gene Hackman is saying to Will Smith that uh, if the enemy is big, you are small. If you're small, you're nimble, they're slow. You turn their strength into their weakness. Well, it's the biology of guerrilla warfare. Exactly, it is. And really, the interesting thing here is his weakness was he had fewer tables, more distance, and he had to have more waiters. I said to him, why don't you create shows? Why don't you say each waiter now had to create their own show, the flambe show, the Irish coffee show, the cut the fish in all sorts of thing, things show, whatever show does come up with a show and creating experience where people use their social media, they broadcast it out, we tell the world people are here. And when you have a show, you know how it is, every other table want to have that show. But guess what? You have the time to do it now. You have the space to run these trolleys through. Uh, you actually have the staff because you don't want to let them go. And actually, he did that a week later. And they were they were able to increase their sales with 40% per head in that restaurant because people are buying the show. So this is one example. You heard it first. Magic cafes are on yeah. the rise. Yeah. Martin, Martin yeah. Called it. Exactly, right? Now, another example. I'll take the hardest hit industry, which is travel agents, right? Travel agents are suffering tremendously around the world. I have a good travel agent friend, uh, and she literally went from being one of the most successful ones in the world to become zero, <laughs> literally zero, right? And and I said to her, what's your plan? And we had a discussion. I said, listen, why don't you part of a little network? They're part of a network where they have some fancy acc accreditation from, from all sorts of stuff called Virtue. And uh, I said, listen, you are about 100 travel agents in your country uh, at that level, this high rank. You have your guest already. All of them has postponed or canceled your trip. Do me a favor. You have all your hotels, all the airlines you deal with all the time. You know them very well. They're all empty at the moment. Why don't you call each of them and you negotiate a very special price if you place, let's say, 100 rooms with them? Okay? So do that. 
And she asked all her travel agents to do exactly the same. They all stated to do that. They actually ended up with having more than 10,000 deals within two weeks. Amazing deals, 40% off, whatever it was. And then they said, listen, sign up to our service. The service is $99. You become a member of our network now. And as a consequence of that, you'll get 40% discount on anything you order for the next year. So Amazon Prime for travel agents. Exactly. You exactly. are good, my man. There we go. So that is the, that's the answer. There is an opportunity everywhere. Every industry can do it. So don't paralyze yourself. This is the moment for you to change, right? I love it. I love it. And folks are loving the conversation. We see great comments. Uh, Linda says, this is fascinating and enlightening. Uh, Deborah is loving it. Ani just says, wow, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so thank you so much, guys. So just to ask some questions from the, from the audience here. Um, I, so, uh, Let's see, I, there's some great ones here. Um, so Pankaj wants to know, you know, what do you actually, you know, what's your prediction? This is a big question, but what is your prediction for the new normal? Like what, is, what does that even mean when people talk about that, Martin? Well, I'll give you three different predictions. Um, the first prediction is uh, the social distancing. Is it going to last or not? And I'm going to tell you the truth, no, it's not. There was an, um, a, a problem happening in the tubes of the underground in, in the UK, in London, where the tube basically broke down. They had a strike going on and two thirds of the entire tube was, was not in function. And as a consequence of that, these uh, travelers, the pendlers uh, basically were asked to, or requested or demanded or forced to find another path. And they all did it. And guess what? And there is this space, basically saved six to seven minutes per trip just using the tube in a different way. Now, after 48 hours, when the, the whole strike was over, uh, something extraordinary happens. Only 5% stuck with that particular path they learned. And 95% went back to the default behavior. And I think that's, in essence, going to be exactly what we see right now. We have already seen that in China. Uh, I've seen it in Singapore. I've seen it in Australia. I've seen it in Switzerland at the moment across the world, as soon as the restrictions are lifting, people almost want to hock each other straight away and we go straight back to normal. And I you know, Dora, you're seeing it big way with the demonstrations in the US. I know in Australia, that's just banning. They're trying to ban the demonstration Saturday. We're seeing the demonstration across whole Europe right now and everyone is as close as they've ever been before. So first of all, social distancing is going to fall completely apart and that in its own right is going to be incredibly dangerous. Um, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing we will see is that this the, the whole flip side of this whole thing will be the screens. And you will see that a lot of employees will come to the conclusion that we don't need people to travel around and fly around a lot. And that's both good and bad. It's good because of the environment. As you know, the, the pollution in Los Angeles went down 51% according to IQ Air, which is a Swiss uh, quality assurance company in terms of air uh, quality control. And what is really fascinating is that's the good side, but the bad side is, that a lot of CEOs and senior managers are saying, why should we meet up in person? Why should we spend time in the offices and with our clients? And do you know what? There's something to it. Um, I certainly would say in some cases, you don't need to jump on a plane to go back and forth for one day. <coughs> in other cases, you really need it because you can't have that deep interaction. So I think as a consequence of that, we'll see two things happening. Uh, air traffic control, air traffic in general will probably drop, in my opinion, by the end of the year, at least 40% from when it was at the peak, at least. Uh, the Emirates Airline, which is the largest international airline company in the world, predicted that they would first buy, listen to this story, this is crazy, by 2022, they'll be back 100% in business. That's the largest international airline company in the world, right? It gives you a sense of how severe this is. With that, you'll have the entire hospitality industry, all the hotels, the marriage, the Sheratons, uh, the Hyatts of the world, they will have a huge hit. And we probably will see some change going bankrupt. And with that, we'll have a lot of casuals without job. So I see that we will have a, a very strong depression going on with 40 million people plus losing their jobs in the US, probably unemployment rate now close to 20%. I think we will have a tendency to a depression like what we saw in the 30s. So that is a second uh, knock it, I want to say. 
the third nugget, I think, is on a positive note. And by, by that, I say on a positive note, because what we're seeing happening now is a lot of, I think, in my opinion, a lot of businesses will really start to appear across the world. Think about this, that back in the days, uh, in I think it was in 1892, uh, just a, a one year before a G was launched, GM was launched in 1908. Both of these years were just when there was a global panic. The panic was happening in 07, uh, and there was a recession in the US just a year before for GE. IBM was launched in 1911. Well, guess what? There was just a recession around that. Disney in 29, HP in 1939, Hyatt, the hotel chain in 57. There was a recession happening there. Heinz, uh, Federal Express, Trader Joe's, all of these companies really were riding on the eighth entry point theory I'm talking about. So here's the good news. You actually most likely will see a lot of new business models, companies and services appear. And I think I, I want to go back to, to a, a, a quote from a, you know, an impressive writer. His name is Murakemi Haruhoki, um, a Japanese writer. And he said that when you come out of a storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what the storm is all about. And I think that's what we will see happening now. That would be a great storm. It is happening now. And there's a lot of opportunities following that. That's fantastic. Martin, you have so many great insights. I hope, you know, all of you guys watching, there's been such positive feedback in the in the comments. And you can see why I love Martin so much, why he's a dear friend. Oh, I think that I really look to. Uh, you make me so happy, Martin. And I cannot wait until we have the chance to hang out again. <laughs> <for some hug. laughs> but uh, thank you for uh, for taking the time. For the, There's lots of other questions that I know we'd love to ask, but uh, we need to, to part ways so Martin can go on about uh, his his day. But I will say this, if you are, have enjoyed this conversation, there's a few things you can do. Number one, click share. So you can share this on your LinkedIn feed so that your friends can check it out as well. Number two, uh, please feel free to interact with each other in the comments. Please, uh, you know, type in your comments about what you think of as the new normal. What are your ideas? What are your predictions? Um, we'd love to learn from each other and strategies that you've seen work. Uh, number three, you can download Martin's great new book, Biology for a Coronavirus World. Just go to his website, martinlindstrom.com. You can see his name and his spelling right there on the screen. And number four, if you'd like to subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter, it's a weekly newsletter where I will tell you about great things like future live streams. Go to, you can open up a new window now, go to doryclark.com slash LinkedIn, and you can, uh, you can go there and hit the subscribe button. Martin, thank you so much. Any parting words from you, my man? Listen, I, I only want to say one thing, that is, uh, it is a, in a world of great change, it is the strongest and the most clever was the surviving, but even worse, uh, or even better, is the person who's the most adaptable to change, which really is making the difference. And I think this is all about being adaptable to change. And I think all of you guys, as depressed as some of you may be, and my hearts are with you, please do me a favor, see there's another opportunity. It is an amazing opportunity. We will all through every generation in the world experience something like this. This is the moment. Don't go into panic. Use it as the upside rather than as the downside. That's fantastic, Martin. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you uh, who are joining us this morning and have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye, everyone.